I haven't seen you in a long time. It has. I don't. I don't. Was it at SPX like three or four years ago? It was a very. I think it was. Yeah, maybe 2016. Was did we? Yeah, it was the Fanographics 50th anniversary party when they had like every. That was actually the last time I went to SPX, and that was so much fun that I was like, it's not worth it. I'm not going to go back anymore. That's it for me. <laughs> That was the first and only time I'd been um, because my book was coming out, but and I, and I was very overwhelmed. It was um, it was a lot to take in. It was it was a, a, I mean the 40th anniversary was so stacked. Mm -hmm. um, I just I just felt like a wor I just felt like a worm. You know, nobody made me feel that way, but that that's how I felt. Like you know, sitting next to Joe Sacco and stuff. Oh. It was amazing. Oh, fuck, yeah. So what was the last show you went to before this all ended? Uh, I, you know, I hadn't been to shows in a few years because I, like the past years since Band for Life came out, I've been like, I spent a while working on a really big like research project um, that got kind of like, it's not, um, it's, it's not uh, sidelined, but it's on the back burner. Um, and then I, yeah, I was just like started teaching and that took a lot of, um, energy and, and like just kind of reorganizing and stuff. So, um, I really wanted to focus on, uh, working on stuff rather than just trying to be making stuff specifically to be ready for festivals. Yeah. And so I, yeah. I hadn't been going, I hadn't been, to, I hadn't, I basically like, after Band for Life came out and I did that whole festival circuit, I hadn't been to the to, to festivals after that, really. Is this book you're talking about, is this the stuff you've been posting on social media that's like you're coloring it with, it's just, I think it's painted? That, so that's a, another project that I started. Well, because the, 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 the book that was based on, it's, it's about the life of a kind of an obscure um, artist illustrator. I don't want to like talk too much about it. Um, because it's still like so, um, you know, in its infancy. But um, but I did a massive fuck ton of research, and I thought that maybe I would write it as a um, as as a prose as a work of prose. Wow. And I and I did. I, I wrote like a I wrote a book about about this person. Um, and then it was just a question of finding you know a potential publisher. Uh, Cause I kind of had a crisis after Band for Life came out where I was just like, Oh my God, cartooning, like, like I had a, I had kind of a personal crisis where I was like, cartooning is so time consuming. Um, I don't think I'll ever be that good at it. And what am I doing with my life? You know, I just had one of those crises. And so I was like, Oh, well maybe um, if I had a writing practice, in addition to the cartooning that then I could do, you know, that I would have one outlet that I could work through ideas more quickly. Cause yeah. we all know that writing is like exponentially faster than cartooning. Or I mean, not, maybe not in your case because you're, you're such a prolific cartoonist, yeah. but. Um, I, I draw my letters too. Like I, that's always was a problem for me as a kid is I didn't write letters. Like I drew my letters. But that's how you're supposed to make your, your letters that's that's how like Jim Rugg would folks would tell you that you're you're supposed to when you're hand lettering it, it's not handwriting it is kind of like drawing to, to mm. make each like mark of the letter I don't know yeah like uh that's why I like hand lettering more than like a digital font because it's it's a part of the art like it's a part of the drawing overall like I like it when it's all on the same page like, I don't even like it when they just overlay word balloons and stuff. Around. No, I don't like that either. I, I try to discourage my students from, from digitally lettering, especially if, they're, if the drawing is handmade, for sure. And what, what percentage of them are doing hand-drawn uh, comics these days? Most of them. Most of them. They're, they're definitely, like, a handful who insist on, on wanting to draw, like, with iPads and stuff. But um, I try to kind of convince them that, I'm like, I'm not against digital drawing. There are some people who can do it really well, but I think like, like for instance, um, I was co-teaching with Helen Joe and Jeremy Tinder this summer and um, Helen's been digitally drawing, but for years she wasn't. And so she was able to like figure out what kind of line quality 
she that really works for her and then translate it to digital i feel like the constraints of working traditionally help you figure out what your your style mm. you need constraints if you don't have any constraints you just it's like hard to narrow things down if yeah. you're if you're just working with the pen and the paper you're kind of working you're kind of like being challenged by that to, to kind of come up with solutions that work for you and your hand and once you've got all that figured out then i think you can translate it to digital well i think if you don't learn how to draw traditionally you're missing out i think yeah. it's like I, I use the metaphor of like boxers training in like by running in the sand once mm -hmm. you are out of the sand you've developed all that muscle memory and stuff that you can like it's just like i think feel like drawing for traditionally is like strengthening yourself yeah that's cool wow so you like teaching now i love it yeah i mean right now in this moment it's horrible because yeah. of covid um just like the logistical stuff is a nightmare but um yeah i i feel like uh teaching has really helped me um well it's it's like you you kind of do get to be a little bit of a vampire because the kids are like have such interesting ideas hmm. that you kind of as an old person you kind of get to be like like oh i want to hear your ideas i want to and you know some of them make work that is like um you know very different from what i would make or or you know they're thinking about things sometimes in in ways that i wouldn't approach things um and it's that's really cool to just you know see how 17 different people approach um a chat you know a, a challenge in 17 different ways and some of them are just absolutely astonishing you had to create a new syllabus or did um yeah like ev like everything from the ground up um every semester basically because um sometimes you have students repeat the class which is kind of weird like it's weird that they can um take that you know they can take the same kind of like co like general comics class multiple times so mm. you kind of have to switch things up which i'm dealing with right now and then um i'm teaching a comics journalism class for the first time starting um in september and then um in the spring i'm teaching a horror comics class which i'm really looking forward to oh that's awesome you yeah. like, like old EC comics? Yeah, we're definitely gonna, we're gonna spend, I mean, that's, that's my bread and butter. That's my favorite stuff. Ooh, like, I didn't know that. Wow. That's my favorite all time comics in the world. Like Mad, uh, Mad Magazine, like all EC, everything EC. Cause yeah. I started out reading Mad. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a, my, my uncle collected the, um, the the paperback collections you know those mad okay. paperback I've collections. Got a ton of those yeah yeah i would go that was the big that for me i mean that's why i have this this alfred e newman oh, yeah. <laughs> um but i would i would go visit my uncle howard and he just had like a an entire bookcase dedicated to the the those mad paperback collections oh how cool yeah, yeah. Um, i always talk about because harry kurtzman's like one of my big heroes oh my god and uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm a big fan of his. And so every uh, occasionally I've had, I've had a couple of people on this channel who like actually like were students of his at the school or people like Dennis Kitchen. I chatted with him and he worked with him a lot towards the end. The School of Visual Arts? Where did Kurtzman, oh, wait, no, where was Kurtzman? They all went to the same, it was like, there was like a high school that everyone went to. Oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The High School of Music and Arts, I think is what it was called. There's like, it turned out a lot of legendary, like a handful of really legendary illustrators from about the same. Yeah. And what happened to that school? Is that still open? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think it, I think back in the day, there was more, there were more like vocational schools mm -hmm. and technical schools. Like, I don't, I think, you know, um, more and more the, the emphasis got on like going to college, but I think. Mm -hmm. Um, like in the in the 40s 50s you could go to like a high school that would train you for a vocation like that's why I feel like all of those cartoonists started their careers really young yeah that's right and they were all I have that um, mad artist edition do you have that no it's, no it's crazy how it's just like 
this is like like a level of cartooning that's just gone. Like I I don't yeah. know who can yeah. do this kind of shit anymore. Well, it's, because it because it was taught as a craft and it like doesn't it doesn't take a rocket scientist. But I feel like I well you know that's what that's what's hard too about teaching comics is like comics is such a big tent. Mm -hmm. Like when, when we talk, when we just say comics, you could be referring to like, you know, so many different things. And so like the style of like mainstream, like humor and superhero cartooning that like, it really should be taught as craft. And it really like, it, and I mean, I don't know much about like, for instance, the Joe Kubert school or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, if that's what you want to do, I feel like you're wasting your time at an art school. I mean, yeah. if you've got enough talent, you can go anywhere and be fine. But like, if you want to learn that like craft, um, I feel like you're better served by just like in that kind of old school apprenticeship model. I think yeah. that that was also like how a lot of, um, yeah, I, I just started reading how to read Nancy and like Bushmiller just, what was he working in like the, he was started out just like as an errand boy, basically at the, was it the New York world or something? And oh, then okay. in, or at some newspaper. And then he just like took over. They were like, here kid, like take over the, take over the puzzles page or whatever. And then, and then like, you know, by age 19, he, he had worked his way to having a strip, like a, mm -hmm. a very successful strip. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of the, there's a lot of grift involved in like sending kids to college for, for four years. Um, kids who might be better served, like, you know, um, just, just going to like a, a trade school or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I mean, that's true. The, the opposite problem was that a lot of kids, like for instance, kids who spoke English as a second language or, or kids who um, were maybe having trouble with academics would get, um, herded into the vocational schools mm -hmm. and so there was there was some like unfairness you know there was a lot of unfairness like and who got who got funneled into vocational schools and who got sent to college yeah absolutely yeah yeah it's true I'm gonna show you the pic I have a picture of Harvey Kurtzman that's hanging above my desk here and I love I got it on so like if you go on eBay um, you can buy these like photos from like the photo morgues of old newspapers that have gone out of business. Oh, wow. And I always look up like ones for cartoonists. And this is one that they ran during Harvey Kurtzman's obituary. And like, look at that pained expression on his face. It's just, <laughs> it's just amazing. And he's got like his shirt open. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's a boss. That's great. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. He is so cool. The greatest Batman stories ever told right here. Um, I, I started reading this because, um, I started reading it because, um, Matt Seneca asked me to be on a podcast about, uh, Batman. Cool. And I, and I was like, Matt, I have literally never read a Batman story. <laughs> I've never read Batman. And so, but I was like, but I looked up a list of, um, artists who worked on Batman and I saw that Dick Spring was on the list. Oh yeah. I really love Dick Spring's artwork. Great name too. Yeah, I know, right? The best. So I, uh, so he was like, "Oh yeah, there's a Dick Spring, you know, finding obviously finding the the issues is more challenging, but this is like cheap and easy to find. This and yeah. this this Dick Spring story is in this Batman book, but I haven't. And the reason it's in my studio right now is that um, so I, you know, I wanted to teach my students about pacing. Um, I, you know, I do like a little unit on all these, you know, different concepts, one on like, you know, camera angles and framing and the one on pacing and one on storytelling and blah, blah, blah. But so, um, and I was trying to find new material to teach them about pacing and this, this very first story that's in this collection, the pacing is absolutely, you know, no pun intended, but batshit crazy. It's terrible. And I was like, <laughs> oh, they can actually learn, like, the final page of this story, like, Batman, I don't know if you can see this, but Batman melts down this silver statuette with a candle. Oh, yeah. And then, like, in one panel, and then he's like, all right, I made, now to, now to find the open tomb in which these vampires sleep, and he's just, like, loading his gun, goes to the tomb, sees the, sees the vampire sleeping in the next panel, Kill, shoots the vampire in the next panel and the story is over in the next panel and you're just like this is so dumb <laughs> <laughs> oh 
almost, but they were like inventing it as they were going along. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And that's why it's, I mean, obviously, yeah, that, that's why I love reading like golden age, um, comics because that because everything got so codified later on that yeah. like all of the weird all the weird proportions all the weirdness and the drawing all the weirdness and the pacing is like it's like primo it's great yeah 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 this is my this is the my Kurtzman um book that I used to teach about this is like it's one of the few books that I, that um has like really extensive thumbnail um images so when I teach about like thumbnailing I use these great Kurtzman examples. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. And that book also has like the overlays for the little Annie Fanny stuff, like the prop. Yeah. Although that, I don't know, that might be too hot for the classroom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this this book is beautiful. I love books that have the that that show you the process. That's like. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, the artist editions and stuff, but like yeah. anything like that adventure, this Adventures of Joe Dell book here that has the, um, that shows you the, the coloring process. Oh, like, I don't have that. Oh my God, you got to get this. This is just absolutely stunning, but you can see um, it's got these overlays that show you like how they did the, uh, oh my God. the color separations. Yeah, it's so beautiful. This book is just absolutely dynamite. Don't you work like that with color separations? Um, sometimes I, I work in like, I feel like the story of my artistic life is like, you know, there are some cartoonists who um, figure out what, you know, like you've got like a Jaime Hernandez who just it's like at such a young age fully formed and just spends the rest of their life working in that mode. Mm -hmm. And um, I, like taught myself to cartoon late in life, uh, or, you know, in my twenties. And then, and, and because I'm self-taught, um, I just have been like figuring it out ever since. And so every major project I start is kind of like a new attempt to figure out the best way to work. I've, I've okay. never, I've never like found something that felt like this is it this is how i want to cartoon forever so like i'm doing um like i've got these like autobiographical comics that i'm drawing at like eight and a half by 11 on copy paper with like ink and gouache then i've got this the the book that um that you've seen me posting probably on instagram that's like fully gouache painted on like really nice um sturdy um watercolor paper the um you know, I've done, I've done comics that are screen printed. I've done comics that are, I've done, I, I've done, um, comics that are like, um, you know, the line work is, is on one layer and the color is on a separate layer. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it just like e everything you can imagine. <laughs> is that how Band for Life was done? The color on a separate layer? Yeah. Band for Life was hand colored in marker. Um, the, but the marker color was on a separate layer and, and I put them together in Photoshop. Um, yeah, more recently I did. And, and then I, I, you know, that is like, I like hand coloring because it just looks less to me, you know, it just looks less like flat. I like the depth that you can get with hand coloring, but I felt like the marker looked kind of streaky and the color didn't reproduce perfectly, you know, it just like it's a little darker printed and yeah, it's just, tricky to pull that off. That that uh don't love that. And then so um I just I did it like a 24 page story for um an anthology that's that should have been out actually got delayed due to COVID. Um but like an anthology from self made hero that British publisher and that I did line art on one layer, gouache color on a separate, limited palette gouache yeah. paint on a separate layer, which I really like that. Like you get the, you get the, and you know, that's something that like watercolor hand color is, is I feel like a pretty tried and true reproduces pretty well, depending on the opacity of the watercolor. So, but yeah. yeah, I don't know, man. I, I wish I, I pray, you know, that, um, there, that I'll like figure out like, this is, this is it. But, um, yeah, yeah. you know, I, Leslie Stein does like watercolor comics and they always look like, like when you get like the actual book, it's like, 
this looks exactly like it probably did when she did it. Like this, I don't know how they reproduced it exactly, how it would look. <laughs> and I don't think she does it. I could be wrong, but I think she just sends them to D and Q to clean up and put. Oh, together. really? She does. You don't think she scans them herself? She well, no, I, I don't actually know if she does it. I know that one time she went to Montreal to drop off the work at the office. Cause she's you're Canadian, aren't you? I grew up in Canada, but unfortunately, I never, my family never had citizenship, so I'm just like, I can't go back there to live, which, I mean, I could, but I would have to go through the whole process, the whole yeah. citizenship process, which sucks, because I would move there in a heartbeat. Yeah, in yeah. Countries. What, what part of Canada did you grow up in? I grew up on Prince Edward Island, um, so the East Coast, the Northeast, um, it's like the smallest, prop. you know who's, who lives there is Tyler Landry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know him. Wow. I didn't know him when I lived there. I mean, I left when I was 14, um, but it's amazing to me that there's like, a, you know, a, an internationally active cartoonist living there because it's so small. Yeah. Um, is that where Kate Beaton lives or is she not? I don't know where she lives. I think she might be in like New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. I always thought she was like a bigger city person. I don't, I don't know much about Cape Eaton. I want to go to Canada. You know, we like Amy and my partner, Amy and I, like, we were just thinking like, we were talking about this like last night, like we were so fucking depressed. Like this is like, it's like such a heavy, like psychically heavy thing going on. Like you can't even dig your way out of it. There's no escape. It's just, it doesn't matter, like, what happens, like, you know, um, I could get, like, a, <laughs> I could, like, get some kind of career advancement or something. It doesn't even, like, I, yeah. just, like, it's, it doesn't feel good. Like, it, <laughs> I wouldn't be excited about it, and, but uh, let's get back to the comics. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know about you, but in the face of insurmountable horror, the only thing I care to do is cartoon. Yeah, yeah. I, that's how it, because thinking about it, like, okay, well, now that all our professional, professional, like, and, like, career goals are just kind of, like, flatlined, yeah. you have to, it's cool, because then you have to get back to the reason why you started cartooning in the first place, which yeah. is just the, the, the joy and the, the calm that it brings. Um, yeah, it must do, so, it must satisfy something in my brain, because uh, I have to do it every single day. Like when I wake up, like I draw every day and it must be some kind of anxiety relief. Like, uh, do you get any crazy feedback from readers on social media or not? Mm, not really. I mean, I, you know, I haven't been, um, I like, I definitely notice that certain things get more likes, certain mm. types of work get more likes. Yeah. Um, and it's usually pretty predictable what, what type of work it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've had to try to ignore that. And every once in a while I get like some rando, you know, like, Hey, I read, you know, one of your books and this, you know, here's my feedback about it. But, um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's pretty minimal, especially since I've just kind of like been, I've been laying pretty low, you know, just, just like I said in the past few years. So it hasn't been. Do you have a Tumblr still or did you get rid of Tumblr? I do have a Tumblr, but I don't use it. I mean, that I by far had the most followers on Tumblr than I had than I have on any other platform. Like I was really engaged with it, and I think it's a much better um, it's a much better format for reading comics yeah, for sharing, yeah, sharing comics. I mean, the Instagram Square. Um, there are some artists who are doing amazing things with the Instagram Square, like making work specifically to kind of be. Yeah. read in that way but um i'm certainly not one of them simon hanselman has been doing really good with that he's been doing like a covid comic on there yeah Wallace Vuo. i mean i think he's a great writer and he's i think he is um you know is his that work is popular for a reason i think it's i think that's very successful work mm -hmm. um, you, you are you um conscious about like what of your like how much of your personal life you put on social media that's that's gotten harder as a teacher now because of my students see it. Oh yeah. Um, and so because I am a very like I I'm my personality is really weird because um I have a lot of social anxiety and a lot of like um 
anxiety surrounding relationships. But um, I think there, I, I feel very comfortable just kind of like at, with the remove of social media. I like to be able to just like sit and like, you know, say whatever from the safety of being alone. So yes. I, I am somebody who would really love to overshare on social media, but I, I and I have to really actively try not to. I, it takes a lot of discipline for me to kind of, to, um, and I feel like I do a pretty good job of be like, all right, you're allowed one tweet a day, you know, that kind of stuff. But like, I would be on there at all hours of the day and night, just, just sharing any little random thing that popped into my head. Cause I'm alone so much that it feels like it's just a little like burst of like energy release or like it, it fulfills. I'm so solitary that being on social media kind of fulfills whatever need I have uh, yeah. for companionship. Yeah. Um, I feel like my attention span has been really fucked by having, and I just got like a smartphone not that long ago, maybe like four years ago. In that span, my, in that time frame, I've watched my attention span absolutely like plummet. It, it's like, it's completely affected the way I consume. And it, like, I read a lot for work. So, um, I, so like if I'm doing class planning or stuff, I'll be like actively reading during the day. And then at night, I just want to be on social media. But like, I, but like this Batman, I was excited about this, this Batman book because I was like, oh yeah, this is something like stupid that I can read. Because like, otherwise my brain is always like, I always feel like I'm working, but like, I'm like, oh yeah, I need to have like stupid book time that's mm -hmm. not social media. That's also not trying to process like great literature where yeah. I'm like, yeah. I only like 80s Batman. Who was drawing Batman in the 80s? Uh, well, Jim Aparo is a really good one. Here, actually, this is one I just got from eBay, which is Batman number 400. And, uh, <laughs> and this has, like, a list of, like, Art Adams, Terry Austin, Brian Boland. These are all, like, amazing people. John Byrne, Joe Kubert, Steve Rude, Bill Sienkiewicz. Like, it's, like, just, like, this amazing issue, you know? But, like, I started collecting, like, just every number in the 400. I just want those issues because that was, like, a really oh. good run. And then as soon as it gets to the 90s, it becomes like X game, X games, like extreme shit. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and so like I, I'm like immediately like, ugh, like fuck all that. I don't care about any of that you stuff. You have like rollerblades or something? What's going on? Yeah, it's just like that's when like the crazy, you know, it's the stuff that like Chuck Forsman loves. Like the super giant guns and it's like really oh, yeah. and super overdrawn and Yeah, like, that's when everything, yeah, that's when everything got like everything started to look like Rob Liefeld and Yeah, exactly. And Marlon, yeah. Right? yeah, it was like yeah, the yeah. most kind of like hyper Yeah, I can't take it. And that's the garbage that like I grew up with like cuz I I'm, you know, I was born in 84, so like the 90s were really like my my era and it was just everything was like like extreme, you know, like it was like you know, like if you want to get deodorant or whatever, it's like Tom Green is selling me deodorant and he's like, yeah, look, I'm fucking a moose's head or whatever. Like, yeah, we're pretty much the same age. So we have the same, we have the same reference point. We yeah. have some cultural touchstone street sharks. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Everything was like crazy. And, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, like the music was like, you know, all the shit that we listened to, like corn and Limp Bizkit and all stuff. But if I'm writing a comic about that era, all I have to do is listen to some of that shit on like a uh, Pandora. And I'm like immediately like brought back and like I can access that stuff so easily. Yeah, all these yeah I've, seen, I've seen some of your comics about that era, like the Jinkos oh, yeah. er era. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like, you know, uh, <laughs> that's like my heyday. And like, and it's funny because that stuff, so many people relate to that. Like it was just everything. Fashion was terrible. And I saw like a, an article on the internet the other day. It was like, uh, early 2000s fashion is coming back and I was like no what it was like there was no fashion then like the 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 early like the Jessica Simpson era and stuff like that like what was fashion at that point there was nothing it was just like weird like tube top you know girls would show their belly or whatever and then like a little like uh Indian like fake tattoo around their belly button and it, yeah it was just fucking <laughs> That's what, yeah, that's what's interesting is that I, I definitely feel old teaching and I feel like a lot of the signifiers like used to be that if you had like, you know, green hair and nose piercings and, ta and tattoos, it was like an underground 
I don't know, like it was, it, it, you just, like you'd see someone else across the room who looked like you mm -hmm. and you'd be like, oh, we're probably into the same music. Yeah. But now it's mainstream. And so you see kids that you think like are probably going to be weirdos and they're, they're, they're just regular kids. They're just like kids who are. Yeah. Raised watching uh, anime or something. Well, what, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was that what you said in the very beginning of this was that like after Band for Life came out, you got kind of bummed out on comics or something, or you, what, did you have expectations for Band for Life that were not fulfilled? No, no, I just, I, it was like all me against myself. Like there was no, it was no like, oh, I expected this to be a huge seller and it's not because um, I knew when I was making it, I was like, my hope for this book is that other people in it who share similar experiences to me will see themselves in this book. Yeah. Um, it's a very niche experience. And so I, I, I definitely wasn't expecting it to be um, like some kind of um, sleeper hit or anything like that. It was more that by the time I had finished that book, I was in my early 30s. Yeah. And I had made one book prior to it. And I had been walking dogs, working in a button factory, doing all kinds of, you know, like, um, just kind of unskilled jobs through my twenties and, and early thirties. And I didn't see a way forward. Like I just couldn't figure out how to continue making comics as an adult of that age mm -hmm. with no, with no, like, um, potential to to support myself doing it yeah um and so that was the crisis it wasn't it wasn't that um it wasn't that oh i'm not you know i'm not as i'm not i thought this was going to be a huge hit and it wasn't it was just like oh i'm old now i didn't even notice like that happened really fast like in the in the years that i that i was making these books i got old yeah. now now what um, and so, uh, and I, you know, I, I didn't go to graduate school. I never, um, I've always, you know, been very wary of academia, um, because like as, back to our earlier conversation, you know, I think there are a lot of things I, you know, I'm self-taught and I think like most things you can either teach yourself or, um, learn in some kind of a trade school situation. So I, it was like, I just didn't know, I thought, I, I actually applied to go back, I was gonna to go to community college. My mom was a substance abuse counselor, she's retired now, but I thought that I would be a therapist like her. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like I needed a career. Mm -hmm. I, felt, I felt like I was never gonna have a career and that I needed a career. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, I remember, you know, talking about, uh, well, I mean, another, to uh, kind of reference something else we talked about, like, you know, uh, I, John P was, John Porcelino was like sort of a mentor to me um, in my 20s. Like he just basically was like, uh, he showed me how to make comics and like what the whole comics thing was about and stuff. And uh, one of the things he told me early on was like, you know, there is no payoff for this. So like, you're going to work hard and you're, if you're expecting some big reward at the end of, of some giant laborious thing, like there's nothing there. So just remember that. And, and and so, but my, so my mountain was Fantagraphics. Like I was like, I want to be published by Fantagraphics, Fantagraphics artist. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, totally. Like once you do it, then you're like, all right, I'm a Fantagraphics artist, but like, <laughs> what, like I'm, I'm, I'm the mountain that I wanted to climb, but like, what's up here? Like what, <laughs> what happens now? You know? <laughs> and it's funny. Like then all of a sudden it's like, you're, you've kind of plateaued and you're like, well, now I'm up here. I guess I'm going to build a house and uh, I'm just going to do some books for Fantagraphics. And, and like, so yeah, like I, I've totally been like, I have constant um, nights where I'm in bed thinking I really should go back to school. I should, I should have something. I shouldn't have the comics be um, the way that I support myself because that is so scary because like it's feast or famine and, you know, I got to take care of myself and I got to take care of my household. I got bills to pay. Like I, I should find something steady and have comics be something that 
helps me live, you know, helps me, um, helps me um, kind of, I don't even know how to put it, like exist or something, or, you know, as an artist, like it's an, uh, an outlet, like an artistic outlet and not be a career. So I constantly think about that, but I don't know, I don't know what to do. Like what am I, what else could I do? Like, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm 36 years old. Like I'm going to go back to school and, and like fucking do what? Or like I could, I could get a job and manage a Starbucks coffee. Like I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, my mom was 52 when she went to grad school to be a therapist. And so that was for me, I was like, Oh, but you can't, I mean, and I think like, you know, when you, um, like, I think it's, it's pretty standard. Like if you go have been to community college or whatever, you know, that people can like start new careers in their sixties. Like people do it mm -hmm. all the time. It does seem, it seems daunting when you imagine being the only, uh, 36 year old at a, um, at a four year institution where everyone is 18. Mm -hmm. For me, it was less daunting, um, thinking about going to community college specifically because I knew that I would be amongst like a, a more diverse group of people you know in in every yeah. um respect but i don't know what like if i want to be a carpenter or something like that <laughs> you know what i mean like, that's I, a good job that's a good yeah i, would, that's I know good. that's a great job i'm saying but like i don't know like if that's necessarily where the road i want to go down no i know no i don't want to do anything but comics and i and i now i bitch and moan about like you know planning these classes and stuff, but like, I fucking love comics. I love yeah. talking about comics. I love reading comics. I always have. Um, it's amazing to me that, that, um, you know, I get to teach comics now. It's fucking crazy. Um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Comics is comics, like, it's, it's really, I mean, um, you know, we had like talks, with um, our students, like during our summer class, it was like me, Helen Joe, and Jeremy Tinder. And Helen Joe, I think of as someone who's very successful in her field. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, still we we compared notes about like parents being like, "So what do you do again? Like, what is this?" Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's painful trying to explain to your family. Only other cartoonists understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it harder for you to explain school spirits to somebody who you've just met? I explain that book to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, no, it, it, yeah. I mean, those books are weird. Now I'm, it, I've been in a, it, this is, man, I, I'm in a really tough phase right now because I feel like um, I always finish what I start. So I'm not worried that, that um, any of this work is gonna go, it's gonna remain unfinished. But I'm at a at a really strange moment where I've got so many projects in different phases of being started and completed mm -hmm. that I know what I'm going to be working on for the next decade, basically. Wow, how does that some, feel? Which is like really it it's I mean it's not good. It it's I mean because I don't even I mean I'm a, I'm a pessimist anyway. So when I see what's going on in the world, I'm like, Oh, a decade. I don't even know, if, you know, if there's, if this, the world is going to. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I, so, so a new, new project that I just started is a, is a YA, a YA, it's a YA graphic novel. Um, and I don't want to talk about that because I, I haven't even, I just got, I just found out that my pitch got accepted, but the, um, I haven't signed the contract. Thank you. But fall 2023. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I would love it if like you became like a, like, um, a hit, like YA graphic novelist. And then like, <laughs> you're like the Rihanna Telgemeier and you just, and you came from Fantagraphics. But like you just like I'd see you at like some show in the future, and you don't even turn and look at the fanographics booth. You just keep walking. And you're <laughs> that would be yeah, that would be funny, but certainly I don't think uh, in the cards. But um, but oh, okay. yeah, I've been very intimidated. I read um, I, do you know Rosemary Valera O'Connell's work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what's it called? Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me. I interviewed her. I, I did the first time I encountered her work was on a panel at Cake. Um, I was doing a really, it was a really funny panel because it was just a very strange 
group of artists that they put all into this occult in comics panel that they then handed to me to moderate. And, um, but I met, I met her there and I, I remember she was the only person on the panel whose um, work I wasn't familiar with. So I looked her up and I was like, Jesus Christ, this person is very young and just like preternaturally talented, mm -hmm. um, like technically just unbelievable. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I read her book, um, Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me recently, the book she did with Mariko Tamaki. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I am curious, I am interested in what younger people are reading. I'm interested in like, as, com as like comics becomes, there are, as there are fewer gatekeepers mm -hmm. in comics and like more and more people of color and women and like, you know, the, the, the floodgates have opened now, which is awesome and like, just um so and, and in order to keep up with younger people like i want like in my students and stuff i want to know what people are reading yeah um, is it good uh yeah you know it is like that book is good that's a good book um yeah. it's a book with with broad appeal um the the artwork is just fucking crazy yeah um like i feel like uh what's the name of that other who did what's who's the artist who did spinning Oh, Tim, Timmy Walden? Yeah, there are these young, these young women who are just like, where the fuck did you come from? Like, I don't even know. I'll never be, I'll never, that, and that, well, that's the other hard thing about teaching, too, is that, like, I understand the mechanics of comics. Like, I've got a very solid understanding of, like, what, I, you know, and obviously it's all, you know, subjective, but, like, there are some things that you can say, like, with pacing and stuff, like, there are some things that objectively, like, either they're working or they're not working. Yeah. And I can identify what those things are, but like, I am not, I am from, my, my aesthetic is like punk, which is always like going to be raw and more emotional. That's the aesthetic that I grew up with. It's the aesthetic that like in my heart, that's, that's the work that I, that resonates with me. Mm -hmm. And, and like the, the expressionists, like the really rough and raw and, and um it, that's work that's made you know and some of those are you know obviously a lot of those artists are highly technically skilled but it has this emotional has this kind of like immediacy this really kind of like you know urgency in the drawing and, and even kurtzman i see that urgency in the in kurtzman's drawings like that that incredible you know i'm not a great technical illustrator i can there are there are moments when i can kind of pull it out if i really have to um, but there are some people who are just like born with, I mean, not born with it all. You've got to learn to draw, but like some people just understand those mechanics, like on, on it, like physiologically from such a young age. Yeah, I know. It's so crazy. But yeah, that's, it's true. And, and Tilly Walden, she was a student when I was at the Center for Cartoon Studies. And she was like the Harry Potter of the school. Like she was like the magic student. Uh, and it was just like, I... She was like basically uh, in her room the entire time, just like churning out books because she would draw like really small. And I think she did two books like the, the time I was there for some like English publisher. And she was like really blowing up. And I remember before I went to CCS, I had a signing at Floating World in Portland because I was going to fly from Portland to Vermont. And um, the guy, Jason, was like, hey, who are like some young cartoonists I should be paying attention to? And I was like, oh, this is cartoonist named Tilly Walden. It's like really incredible. He's like, oh, all right, all right. He did, I don't think he looked her up. And then it's like the next year, she's like winning Eisner Awards and shit. And I'm like, damn it, dude. You should have you tried to publish something by her while you could have, because now it's like, I can't imagine. I mean, she's like the new Raina Telgemeier. Like, she's, she's blowing up all over the place. It's incredible. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't have those chops. You're an amazing drawler. What, I can't allow you to say these kinds of things about yourself. Oh, that's very kind. I, I, I've, I've worked really, every, everything that I know about drawing, I fucking worked so hard for. And it's really, it feels like a struggle. It doesn't feel like something that came naturally or easily. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but so I, what I wanted to ask about was, did Dan Nadell like discover you and, and, and publish you first? Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dan is my, Dan is, is like, um, a wizard to me. He's, I will always, I know there's lots of like, meh, meh, meh about Dan, um, you know, but like, I, I'm, I'm a number one Dan fan for life. Um, <laughs> he, he's been an angel to me. And I feel like, 
that's something that happens in comics too is that like people um have these like angels to them like people who like like annie koyama is someone who like absolutely just like um is supporting half the community at all times yeah. um emotionally and financially and um spiritually and i mean like there there are people who at different moments in time have kind of stepped in um you know to our lives and like really made a big difference and dance that person like that number that first person for me um i i was friends with um well, I, primarily Carlos Gonzalez, but like I knew those Providence guys. I knew CF. I knew um, Brian Chippendale, and I had met Matt Brinkman and stuff. Um, and Dan, before he published me, started distributing my zines. Um, I started making. I just started making zines even before I met those guys. I, I met them while on tour, um, and. Uh, you know, I often think that I should have just made like autobiographical work about being in a band, but whatever. I don't know. I mean, it is all based on my life, but like it's all fictionalized. But I, sometimes I feel like I should have just told the real stories because that that I the older I get, the more I want to tell my stories. Yeah. And I've talked to other cartoonists who I feel like have come to kind of similar realizations. Um, like Ben Passmore too. I I, I talked to him for my class, and we were kind of like yeah we our favorite stuff to do is like this crazy fiction like but the stuff that that seems to resonate most with people is the nonfiction, mm -hmm. and it's kind of hard to accept that sometimes but speaking of like audience and what what you know an audience is interested in thinking about that seems weird because that's something i never thought about before yeah. but i don't even remember what i was talking about oh yeah so providence so yeah i i was making zines I just started making them. I don't, I, I remember what the first zine I ever made was, but I don't know where I got the idea to start cartooning. He, so he started distributing your mini comics and then he asked you like, um, like were your mini comics, was that School Spirits? Like were you doing that like as pieces and then he wanted to put it together as a one book? Yeah, there were pieces. I think like he distributed my zines for a handful of years. Um, I don't remember, I think there was a moment where he like intimated that when I had enough material, he, he would maybe publish a book. And I had, I had been publishing like a school, I had been publishing, yeah, like so a few issues of what, or whatever of School Spirits. But then when he, when, when it was like official, I went back and, and reworked all that, that material oh. and kind of started from scratch. And then, uh, <laughs> and you're like, all right, I'm gonna have my first book out. And then he's like, guess what? I'm going out of business. <laughs> yeah, that was my that was my first taste of like, yeah, this is a tough, this is a this is a set because because picture box to me was like, I mean, I love fanographics too because like you know, first I, I was into Mad, then I got into Crumb, mm -hmm. like I I learned about like the you know about kind of like the sixties undergrounds from yeah. Mad. It was like a, a logical progression, and and so I loved Crumb. Um, and and I loved fan and and I knew that Fantagraphics had published him, you know, and that 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 was like a, a like a something to aspire to. But like the artists that I saw my age who were making work that I could that seemed like it was like in my world were were all Picture Box. Yeah. Um, and so to be published by Picture Box was like such a big. Um, goal for me and then and then when yeah i mean primarily i just felt sorry for dan because i loved dan as a person mm -hmm. i think because i loved dan um the the actual public the him ceasing to publish like i saw how that could be well i saw how his personal life was um you know was made difficult and i saw how he could um how by ceasing to publish, it could relieve some of that stress for him. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I understood that it was like this one person labor of just, you know, passion and insanity, like all mm -hmm. comics publishers, really. I mean, Fanta, Fanta is a team of insane people, but like, um, then, uh, yeah. so, so it was, that cushioned the blow. 
knowing yeah. that that um that you know that he just needed to move on with his life and did he put you in kramer's or was that sammy that was sammy and you know come to think of it i think i think getting published in kramer's might have been the lead up to me getting school spirits oh yeah i think the progression things and like emailing me but it was going into my spam box yeah um and so i didn't get that email and and then finally i think dan was like hey sammy's been trying to get in touch with you have you heard from him and i was like what because <laughs> those, those kramers were like my bot you know my bible at that yeah. point too yeah. um and so I, I, I but i had been scheduled to go on a six-week tour of the west coast and by the time I got that email from Sammy, it was like a couple weeks before, it was like two or three weeks before tour, and I couldn't back out of tour, but I was like desperate to be in this Kramer's, so I like, I drew that story, and then I had my friend color it for me while we were on the road, and I was like calling him from like, you know, a rest stop in Texas or whatever. I like, I hand colored with marker, like, like photocopies and was like, all right, you, now you do the digital color. Um, and I paid him shit, you know, and, and he like, it was like a fuck ton of work. Um, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and it broke up my five year relationship. I was like, so because I was in a relationship with the, my bandmate, um, and it caused so much tension between us, like my freaking out about this situation that he broke up with me. Then when I told that story at, um, when I told that story at this Kramer's panel at Cake, um, Sammy was like, you could have just told me and I would have waited for you to like have your piece finished whenever. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, well, I think it probably needs to get shaken up anyway. I don't know. Kramer's is like a legit, like institution and comics, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, t times change. And I think like, you know, I, I'm right on the cusp of like, like, cause I, cause like I see people coming for Danny, at, uh, I mean for um, Dan and Sammy and like people who are like, you know, Kramer's isn't diverse, doesn't have enough diverse creators in it or whatever, you know, cause times times have changed like what yeah. what was like the coolest cutting edge thing when we were younger is not it, you know it's it's like has become problematic for different reasons or whatever is going on mm -hmm. um and so and like i'm i'm i i i feel like i'm on it's a weird balancing act for me in a lot of ways like like because like what was cool when i when when we were like coming up as cartoonists is not cool anymore yeah i mean just in terms like people don't know what kramer's is people don't you know now and and then sammy was getting like flack for you know not having diverse enough creators in the most recent kramer's hmm. um and 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 it's it's hard because like i i know and love sammy i know and love dan i know that they're like good men with like you know and and aesthetically the stuff that they published is like the stuff that I that will always be like dearest to me yeah, yeah. um and so like seeing people um you know having beef with them or whatever really upsets me mm -hmm. but then I'm also like just so thrilled that that comics has become more diverse um mm -hmm. and that like you know I feel like our generation was the last one where you'd have an anthology that had like one or two women in it yeah 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 like do you remember um probably the most egregious thing was that show called masters of american comics and I, you know that show was I, you know what when what? we're talking about why i started drawing comics i kind of feel like that was like one of the reasons i went to see what? that show i drove from chicago to milwaukee oh, to see wow. that show um yeah, and yeah. it was absolutely incredible but yeah not a, not a woman in not a single woman nobody of color <laughs> It's just, well, unless you count George Harriman. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, but but I also would have, God, I would have loved to have been in that show. I would have loved to see that. That show was fucking spectacular. That yeah. show was an absolute, yeah, just absolutely. I, that was how, because like I said, you know, I was teaching myself to cartoon, so I saw those giant, gigantic original pages on the wall. 
and was like, oh, that's the size that you are supposed to draw. Cool. Like now I know, like, I guess 18 by 24 is like the <laughs> standard size that you're supposed to draw a, like the comics page because they were enormous. I mean, to me, that time they seemed huge. Yeah. Wow. And like on like really thick Bristol board they don't even make anymore. It's like all <laughs> they have these like amazing art supplies that don't exist. Yeah. yeah, that was that was a real I mean, I knew that I couldn't, you know, achieve the technical mastery of those guys. But uh, but just seeing that work in person, seeing it because, it, yeah, I don't think there's any substitute. I think like I interviewed Jaime Hernandez for like um, a stop he was doing on a book tour um, at Quimby's recently. And um, uh, he was he talking about like going to the Billy Island Cartoon Museum, just being kind of bored seeing the originals but I'm like you're Jaime like you're seeing those originals in your like you know studio every day like yeah it's boring to you but like seeing seeing that stuff is really instructive I think in a way that like seeing um seeing the printed page isn't although I mean obviously the work is intended I'm like a real stickler for the printed page. I think like comics are intended. That's how the comics are intended to be read and understood. But like, yeah. if you're, if you want to make comics, I think like seeing the original artwork is so instructive. Oh, that was why I moved to Columbus and I lived there for a couple of years to just, I was just at the Billy Ireland all the time. You go in there and say, uh, can I see like um, some Harold Gray originals? And they, okay. And they, and they bring out a cart with a box full of them and you put on little white gloves. And I would just sit there looking at these originals and it, it was like an amazing gift you know and uh you can just see like what like what thing because you're right like it's made for print so but then you see like well because they know it's made for print like what stuff do they know is like not going to show up like what corrections did they use and like what were their methods and the scratching out stuff to like make rain you know like oh god it's just amazing yeah i, I love that stuff you know and I, yeah i'm like you like i just love comics like I, I love I love old comics I love the way they smell you know like I, I love that there's so much shit to like discover like I just I just got this book from um Toronto Quarterly um I can't pronounce his name it's like a Gekaga guy he's like Yoshihiro Tsuj or something like this uh, uh-huh yeah I know who you're talking about amazing like I don't even I don't know anything about this okay, stuff. Maybe. was it I think it's pro I think it's pronounced Suge Oh, okay. Yeah, it, man. I, and it's just like, uh, that's what I love about this stuff. And, you know, it's not even just comics. It's like there's on Facebook, like Mark Newgarden posted like a, a, a trailer for like this DVD of, of these cartoons that were made entirely with puppets, like in like the 50s and stuff. And I'm like, I've never seen this before. Like, oh my God, like this is like what makes me want to stay on this earth is like all this incredible shit that you don't know about that you get to like discover and like it's all new to you and you get to explore it and like be immersed in it as much as you want and uh yeah man it's just like a, a, such an amazing time to be alive because there's just such a back catalog of like incredible art that's already been made and then you get to experience the stuff that's happening now like you're saying like the gates are opening now like comics are just opening up for like everybody so you're getting all these new stories from different kinds of people you don't ever you know, because comics are about empathy, right? So, like, you're getting you're getting to like kind of live in other people's shoes through their stories and stuff, and and everybody's getting to tell their own stories. And I don't know, it's like it's, it's the best time to be in this, to be like here, you know. So that's so what beautiful. Doing. You got me. I yeah. No, I think that's I I I think uh, that's such a beautiful statement that comics are about empathy. I think you're a hundred percent right. I think that's exactly yeah. That's like such a strength of. Of, of comics is just bringing you into like all of these people's mm. worlds and experiences and yeah it's we're we are very lucky it's easy to to lose sight of that um because there's so much scary shit going on but mm. um all right well i'm gonna let you go <laughs> i took well, i took a lot of your time um i'm such a chatterbox that i will just go on all night but thank you so much it was really good uh to see you good to, yeah. to catch up and um yeah i wish best health and yeah. well-being and tell are you still with uh lane i am yeah, tell him i said hello i will i sure will